justice in the EU settlement scheme. So I think we might be hearing a bit more about digital. Anyway, Kuba. Um, thank you for pronouncing it for me. I always struggle to pronounce algorithmic um, politics, so, so thank you. Um, we went from the macro levels to looking um, at the UK to create Yarmouth, and now um, I'm going to do something very nebulous and take you into the cloud, because the cloud is where the digital status actually resides. But as somebody smart once said, there is no such thing as a cloud. There is just somebody else's computer. Um, and that does cause some problems, so I'm going to be talking about them. Uh, what I'm presenting is part of research funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, um, same program as Charlotte's project, so um, governance after Brexit. And today I'll, I'll be talking about Brexit digital borders and something that I call transactional status. Um, the findings I'm about to present come from uh, a collaboration with the 3 million and that explains the, um, the double affiliation that 3 million um, are a research partner on the project. So basically, the argument holds that previously um, immigration status was evidence with a token, um, a permanent residence card, a biometric residence permit, um, a visa sticker, something like that. Currently, there is no token of immigration status, and immigration status is not so much evidenced as it is generated during online checks, and I'll, 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 show, you, I'll show you how. So it's the algorithmic logic that kind of navigates all kinds of records that the Home Office has assembled about you, and that generates status in real time, and that's, that's, the, big, that's the big shift. So, um, we had quite a few words about the USS. I won't say too much about it. It's just, um, I'll just reiterate that it's a brilliant case to study uh, digitization of border controls because digitization in the USS is from one end to another. So the application route, as you can see in the slide, for most people that would be for an iPhone app, or sorry, a smartphone app. I happen to have an iPhone, but smartphone app. And then that app scans your face, it scans your passport, it does some processing, then it sends off um, data to the home office. There is further uh, processing of data happening in the home office. A lot of people would have status granted without needing to send a single piece of um, evidence to the home office, and that's revolutionary. What's even more revolutionary, retrieving that status is digital only and online only. So whilst there were exceptions to that app that, that you can see on the slide, there are no exceptions to the website that I'm about to show you, this is the only means of evidencing status. Now, that raises a couple of types of problems. Uh, one of them relate to digital divide and discrimination. Charlotte and, and, and Catherine already spoke of those. Different people will be able to use it differently and how does the system cope with that? Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the other bit, um, the digital design itself. What does it do? And how does it reconfigure immigration status um, exactly? Um, as Charlotte mentioned, but it's really important to point out that digital status in itself is maybe not incompatible with the withdrawal agreement because during the negotiations, the UK asked for it to be included in the withdrawal agreement and the EU side agreed to it. That was the sequence of events. Um, and so the withdrawal agreement in Title II, Article 18.4 says, those eligible for residence rights under this title shall have the right to receive a residence document, which may be in a digital form. So a document in a digital form is fine. But it's not the document, it's a website. Um, it looks like this. So if you kind of think of a digital document, if you think of an immigration document, you probably expect to see something like this, the biometric, uh, sorry, the permanent residence card. Um, if you think about the digital document, you may think about something like that. So the COVID pass, that's a document. But this isn't, it's a website. So. This website, by the way, was launched um, two years ago for status checks, but as you can see in the screenshot, it's not from two years ago, it's from two days ago. It still says beta on it. Um, and there are those jokes in the world of software development that everything is always in permanent beta, right? Because the digital systems are constantly um, iterated, diagnosed, redeveloped, and tweaked, but it's, 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 it's not a joke. It's like this is literally how it works. Um, <coughs> So what does this website do? If you go to it, it asks you for um, the, 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 the number of the passport or ID um, card that you used to apply uh, for status, then you put it in. Um, you have to have access to email or phone number that's used for the application to be able to receive a security code. And again, Charlotte alluded to that process. There, it's multiple steps for you to be authorized before you even um, get to it. Once you get to it, if you want to evidence status to somebody else, you have to generate what's called as a share code, and then your status checker, so the landlord, employer, um, and so on, uh, has to input that share code and their own details into the website 
to then view your status. Um, the system does record the details of the status checker itself. So it's a system for checking the status holders, but also ensuring that the status checkers comply with delegated border control duties. Um, but then again, it's not a document, it's a website, but it's not all of it, right? This is just the user interface. So what's behind it? And that's where it gets really, really interesting because we keep talking about status, but people who have status under the USS can have multiple statuses recorded for them. And in fact, there are over 800,000 people who have more than one status under the USS. Um, there are over 13,000 of people who have more than four statuses under the USS, and that's because the system allows repeat applications. As of last year, it also includes applications made under other immigration routes. So if you had a skilled worker visa and a USS application, the system will see them both. Um, but let's stick to the USS. And I'll, I'll just explain to you why this makes it complicated. So this person here, let's say they're an early adopter. They applied to the USS as soon as it launched. They had an expiry, uh, they had an ID document that was about to expire in two months. They put in an application and they thought, hang on. The document will expire, the digital status is tethered to that document, that makes no sense, I'll have to be updating the document as soon as I get status. So they withdrew that application. They got a new ID document and they made a second application. That's the application um, in the top right corner. And that application got pre-settled status, there was full trail of residence for them, no need to send anything in, they've got status, happy days. Now, a couple of years passed and they accrued five years of residence, which entitles them to full settled status. So they put in an application. That's application number three. But it's last here because it wasn't decided right away. And it wasn't decided right away because there was a mistake in it. So as soon as this person realized there was a mistake, they phoned up home office and they said, I made a mistake in my application. The home office response at that time would be, just put in another application. Because it's easier to apply again than to rectify a mistake already made. So this person followed that advice and got settled status right away because they have the full digital footprint. And then the third application was decided last and it was refused because they didn't need to engage with it and the home office told them, it's fine, you've got pre-settled status, you've got settled status, it doesn't matter if there is a refusal lingering somewhere in the system. Now, the problem with that is that if this person went to view and prove their status on the 1st of July 2021 when the system became fully operational, they would see the refusal. And that's because the logic of the status check was coded to show the most recent user interaction. Um, the Home Office confirmed as much in, 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 in correspondence with us, um, and they said, this issue was caused by the logic by which our status services react to casework events, such as applications or grant of status. When the problem was occurring, it was because our services logic was to overwrite old statuses with a new one, because we believed this would be the most relevant one to display. We have changed the logic since. The problem with that is that since July 2021, there were numerous changes to how the business logic of the status check operates. And we still keep seeing glitches. And now, um, if time allows, I'll show you the five main types that we have already identified. So, first of all, there are glitches around multiple applications. So, for example, you have pre-settled status, you apply again, you lose access to your pre-settled status, you can see only a pending application. There are also other types of repeat application glitches. Then, Last April, other immigration routes were brought into the scope of online status checks. And we saw cases such as that person with a skilled worker visa who had three years left on their visa, but in the meantime became a durable partner of a new citizen. So they applied under the USS because it's easier, cheaper, faster, gives you more rights in principle. That application was refused but the, the person was applying for a job in the meantime. Before they managed to, it was refused incorrectly, but before they managed to appeal that refusal, they had to evidence their status. They went online, they could only see the USS refusal. Three workers left on skilled, uh, three years left on skilled worker visa, no way to access that. Then we have appeal implementation glitches, and more and more appeals come through. Appeals basically overturn the decisions of the Home Office to refuse status, but we have seen cases, and it seems that, again, this is caused by particular configuration of the business logic of the status check and the way the records are configured in home office databases, where you log in with your ID document, the tribunal said, you have settled status, the home office said, yes, we now change it to settled status, and you still see that refusal, because it seems that appeal implementations are done on a different case working system than the original decision, and the system goes haywire. 
then there's corrupt digital status. Uh, believe it or not, but if your um, photo cannot be drawn from the um, um, uh, immigration asylum biometric store, which is a completely separate website to everything else, then the status will display. And this can happen for maintenance reasons, but also there are problems with displaying status because in early days, the Home Office didn't want to refuse people who submitted a low resolution photo. So they accepted them, but later they changed the system to have a higher resolution threshold for photos. So if your photo was of insufficient quality, then your status wouldn't work. And that happens without any intervention from me or a casework or anybody else. It's just an IT tweak, uh, which stop your status from working. And finally, that's my kind of personal favorite, and I shouldn't be excited about this because this is, this is a massive, massive issue for a lot of people um, and, and a breach of not your immigration rights, but also your uh, data rights. We see something that we call entangled digital status. So basically, there is no stable link between all those records that you have in all those databases. It's the, the system matches them on the go. You say who you are, you put in your ID document number, and the, the system goes, oh, I think you're this person. So, we saw cases where a person A logs in with their identity document and they see the status of another person. And that can happen when biographic details are very similar. So for example, if you have a twin brother or sister, you may be potentially be seeing their status rather than yours if you, if you try to log in. But this can also happen um, in, in, in processing. There have been cases of, of that happening, of that entanglement happening due to caseworker errors. Um, and, and again, this is, this is the evidence for that is, is us querying those instances with the home office and the home office going like, yeah, you know, actually it, it does happen. So now where does that leave us? That leaves us with something very different, different to what we had in terms of what immigration status is. And this is on, based on the case of the USS, but digital status checks apply to everyone now, to all other immigration routes. So this is basically how, how it works. Um, these status glitches may sound technical and obscure, but they tell us something very, very important about the configuration of digital immigration status. And while tracing those glitches and following them up in correspondence and discussions with the Home Office, we established that the digital immigration status is not a discrete immigration record linked to a stable user profile or a token. Instead, it is best described as a transactional system that both retrieves and records data in the process of status checks. It is comprised of that algorithmic logic that determines which records need to be displayed in a particular moment. And then it draws on various um, data stores with images, with immigration records, with biographic records. And if anything goes wrong downstream from, 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 from the digital status, the digital online document, then your status won't work. So the view and proof service may work perfectly, but if there is a database crash somewhere downstream, your status will not display. Um, and the system is transactional because it responds to, to, to all sorts of events, to, to users making applications, to case workers making decisions, but also, as you can see, to the IT guys making some tweaks to the platform. That's, that all can, can, can make the status um, go wrong. So to wrap up, um, I'll say the Home Office's line on digital status is, is, is that it's good because it can't be lost, stolen, or tampered with. That's the standard line that the Home Office gave. Um, and they're right. I agree. It cannot be lost. It cannot be stolen from you. And you cannot tamper with it because you don't really have it, do you? Yeah. <laughs> That's a bit of a...